Hey guys, my name is Robert Bader. I'm the founder and CEO of Micro Credential Multiverse, and I'm recording this video for Portal Schools, uh, Portal Learning. And uh, I'm going to transition to my slides now, but I wanted to uh, just introduce my, myself really quick before I got into it. All right, let's get into it. So uh, I've just called this presentation Exploring the World of Micro-Credential Ecosystems with the goal of creating a smarter workforce that's, that unites learning experiences with career opportunities uh, more coherently, uh, by the way. So uh, generally, at the beginning of this presentation, I would differentiate based on some burning questions, but we've already done the in-person version of this presentation, and there were a lot of really good questions. But for now, uh, maybe grab those questions, jot them down, and if you want to reach out to me uh, through the work that's happening at Portal, uh, feel free. I'm always available. All right, so let's first start with all great challenges, which is the why. Why? What is the market problem that my company seeks to address? Well, Nine out of 10, oh, more than nine out of 10 of executives say that it's somewhat or very challenging to find employees with the appropriate skills and talents. So this isn't some employers, this is an overwhelming majority of employers that are having this problem. And this is one of the biggest problems in the economy today. So let's look at some of the things that are contributing to this, this challenge of finding uh, appropriately credentialed or qualified folks for for open jobs, for well-paying jobs, for jobs that people really want. So there was a survey done. And by the way, at the bottom of all these slides, you're going to find my sources because I was paying attention in science class. And I agree that it's important to cite your sources. So if you want to go a step further and say, how do I know this is the case? Uh, all of my sources are at the bottom. OK, but I digress. So first, let's look at the evolving skills, which are one of the contributors to why nine out of 10 executives can't find uh, a well-qualified person for a role. So the first is that one in three of those jobs um, have changed. So every four, three or four years or so, one in three, at least 30% of those skills are going to change. So you know, skills like collaboration may be more valuable than they used to be. Skills like being able to present uh, remotely, which kind of hits close to home right now. Uh, suddenly becomes in vogue after the pandemic when a lot more work is happening online. So this is what we're seeing. All right, one in five of the skills that you're finding in a general, in a job description for a job, one in five of those are brand new. So this wasn't even on anyone's radar, maybe uh, as, as early as just two or three years ago. Uh, think about AI, right? So AI has really made its debut more recently. And um, you're starting to see a lot more job applications with things like uh, prompt engineering, right? Like having more meaningful conversations with AI so that you can do your work faster, better, you know, all these sorts of things. So about 25, 20%, 20, 25%, one in five, let's say, of the of the average of the skills requested in an average US job are, are completely new. So brand new. And this is going to continue to be the case because three in four, most jobs changed more between 2019 and 2021 than the previous three year period. And right now there's work being done by the Department of Labor and these sorts of folks. Um, but I would wager a guess that the number of jobs uh, changing is probably going up, meaning this is accelerating over time. So we're going to have to adapt faster than we ever have ever, we really have had to in the past. Um, so let's look at learners, what's happening with them, right? So like learners aren't just going to let the world change beneath their feet without um, doing anything about it. So what are learners doing about it? Like you guys. So six out of 10, more than half of those learners are what we call professional learners in the sense that they're adapting by enrolling in some kind of professional development or extracurricular or co-curricular learning experience uh, just this year. So every year, folks are learning new things, regardless of if they're in school or in college. Uh, they're really taking learning into their own hands. And about three and four of them uh, three out of four consider themselves lifelong learners. So this isn't going anywhere. They're going to continue to adapt over time. And about half uh, of folks who consider themselves lifelong learners say that that extra training helped them advance within their current company. So this isn't even just future facing. This is adapting 
to stay where we're at right now. Um, there's a famous character in uh, the Alice in Wonderland universe named the Red Queen who has to run as fast as she can to stay in the same place. This is a little bit like that. And uh, like always, I have my sources below. Now, I wouldn't be a very good science teacher if I just, you know, said a bunch of numbers at you and I didn't summarize it. Like, what does this mean? So here are some key takeaways. So the first is that the learning landscape is fluid. So adapting to new skills is no longer a choice. It's really a necessity. Uh, the second thing is that traditional education pathways are really having a hard time keeping up and, and they're really not able to. So that's why you're seeing all these new kinds of learning and certification and boot camps and accelerators and micro micro learnings and all these sorts of things. Um, traditional education pathways are having a really hard time keeping up. So they're adapting. So like the learners and the skills, they're trying to adapt as well. The third is that learners are already adapting. So like we've already explored about uh, most learners consider themselves lifelong learners in the sense that they're always adapting. Uh, the fourth is that employers need agility. So employers, like those 95% of executives that we mentioned before, they really need more agile learning systems to know. Uh, so they know, what do you know? And how can I apply this? And who should I hire? And where am I getting these people from? And et cetera, et cetera. Employers are, are wrapped up in this. And I would say in a lot of ways, the employers um, are, are maybe the largest stakeholder because uh, like we saw in 2019, when employers when it's impossible for them to do their work, things start shutting down. So this is really a three-sided problem and we'll get a little bit into that. Uh, lastly, economic resilience should be the goal. So thinking about the next big catastrophe that we all have to deal with, right? The economy shouldn't shut down when that happens because then things start to get a little scary. Um, economic resilience is the real goal of this transition to a more skills-based uh, professional development learning economy that we're quickly moving towards, as you guys can see. So now that I've set the stage, I'm going to properly introduce myself. My name is Robert Bader. I'm the founder and CEO of Microcredential Multiverse. And you can reach me here, microcredential.info or microcredentialmultiverse.com or microcredential.xyz, or you can just Google me or smoke signals. Uh, there are lots of ways to find me online, but you will probably find me talking about things like skills, digital badges, digital wallets, skills descriptors. These are all the different um, moving parts of bringing this uh, rapidly evolving and rapidly uh, <laughs> approaching paradigm uh, to bear, right? So like, what are all the different, uh, you know, technologies and skills, these sorts of things. So th th this is what I talk about on a daily basis. Ask me about uniting learning experiences with career opportunities, though. And like any good journey, really, it starts with a with a why. So I actually started my career pretty early on as an educator. I was a sixth grade teacher, and I did a quick evaluation of my students, like any good science teacher would. And I just tried to figure out what people knew. And when I got, you know, relatively uh, not so good results back, I asked, like, what's the deal, guys? What, uh, you, you know, you never thought about science before at all. And they said, what I wasn't expecting, which was, what do you expect? We're from, and this is the district I taught in. And this was a really heartbreaking thing for me because they didn't know this, but I grew up in the same place that they did. So imagine if in sixth grade, I had the mindset that, well, what do you expect? I'm from this area. And I thought, wow, this is my why now. This is really what, um, what really formed the rest of my career. And, uh, I'm sure you guys are going to have um, equally personal experiences throughout your uh, professional career, and it's going to shape the rest of your uh, your professional journey. So let's talk a little bit more about my journey, because uh, there were a few twists and turns, which you'll likely experience. So 2001, I was kind of in your shoes. I was a student. I actually went to a CTE high school. It was hard to get me to sit down in place, especially if you weren't um, getting me to do something with my hands. I was a little anxious. So uh, when I wasn't in the classroom, uh, uh, I went to a CTE school for architectural drafting specifically. I was interested in like Sim City and cities and houses and buildings and how do they make them and who designs them. And that was what I did sort of my, my every day, right? But on the weekends, 
I was in the woods. I was an Eagle Scout and I like to build fires and shelters and ropes courses and like sit out in nature and how does this all work? And that's really what got me excited about learning was the experience of it. Um, so a lot of what I did uh, before I graduated from high school was around experiences. Um, this isn't to say that I didn't do my everyday studies. I did math, my writing and all this stuff, but it's not really what got me excited. The experiential stuff is what got me excited. Um, so right after graduating, um, uh, I wasn't planning on going to college, but I ended up going to college. It seemed like the best option for me. And I went to a small school, uh, right near where I grew up called Kane university. And I majored in everything. So I majored in all the things. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but um, by the end of my two years there, I decided that science was really direct the direction that I wanted to go. So I transferred into a uh, science program at Rutgers University. Notice the word pivot here. So as you're moving through your journey, I want you to start to think about what are the different pivots you've already made? You might still be in high school, but you're already pivoting. And after graduating high school, um, I continued to pivot, like you probably will statistically, and we'll get to that. So first step of my pivot was I went to school for science, so I got a job doing science. I worked in a bunch of laboratories and wore a big white coat and gloves and goggles and all that stuff. And um, unfortunately, it was a little isolating. I was working in a clean room. I was not really working with a big team of people. I was doing a lot of solo work. And uh, I wanted to really get other people excited about science. I wanted to engage with everyday people and get them excited about science in the same way that I was excited uh, back when I went to college. So I became an educator. I became a high school teacher and I had that first experience that we talked about. But really, um, the hard part wasn't getting kids excited. That was the easy part. The hard part was learning how to be an educator like how to go from applying my science skills to um, really embedding those science skills and sharing those in science, those science skills uh, with others. And that those are teaching skills. They're different than the science skills. And it was tough. The teacher training just really wasn't great. And it was, there was a lot going on, but I just didn't think that it was a good fit for me. So I started to think, okay, how can we focus more on competency? How can we focus more on the stuff that I'm learning on the weekends and at night when I'm on YouTube and I'm doing my own research? Like, why is that professional development and learning invisible when, you know, this other stuff that I don't feel like is super effective um, is what I'm being recognized for? So this led me to pivot again. There's our word of the day uh, uh, with a nonprofit. And um, I realized that they were doing some work around micro-credentialing and competency-based learning. And I thought that seems more sustainable. That seems like something I want to do. So I pivoted from my, my job as a teacher and I became a project manager for a nonprofit organization, um, a brand new initiative called Micro-Credentials. This is like 10 years ago almost. And it brand new. No one thought of this. So it was, it was cool to get in on a project pretty early on um, and really scale something up. I moved out to California. I worked in like startup culture and it was very cool. I uh, did that for a bunch of years and then I pivoted to some executive work. So once the micro-credential kind of skills-based space formalized, I started working for companies and figuring out like, okay, how do I build a business around this kind of new professional learning and development that I've through no fault of my own, started to become an expert of having worked in it for so long, especially from the beginning. All right. Why did I tell that story? So, and these are just some of the companies I've collaborated with over that time, which is always very nice. But why did I tell that whole story? Well, it's because if you're listening to this, you're probably going to change your careers five to seven times throughout your working life. So if you aren't ready feeling a wave of validation, um, I want you to start to think about your professional career. In other words, where are you now? Where do you want to go? And how are you going to get there? A third of people are going to switch jobs every single year. So you might actually fall into that category of people who you're rethinking this, you know, every single year or something like that. Um, and more of this is going to be the case as we uh, as time goes on, you're going to have more people pivoting through careers more frequently as things continue to evolve and they force you to adapt. So 
let's talk a little bit about my company and then we'll talk a little bit about your future. So my company, we unite learning experiences with career outcomes. So like I did throughout my um, pivots, my various pivots, I like to unite what happens uh, behind the scenes with what happens in your professional career. So what kinds of learning experiences are you uh, attracted to and how do those things connect with actual opportunities so that everyone is making the most of their time? So let's talk about how we do this. So here are the basics on micro-credentials. You're going to become an expert real quick. So we created this thing called the skills continuum. And these are all the different technologies and kind of methodologies and ideologies that contribute to this new future that we're all rapidly uh, accelerating towards. There's things like micro-credentials right in the middle. And you'll see these things online if you Google them, your career certificates, micro-credentials, short courses, accelerators, boot camps. There's lots of different names for them, but we'll talk about what those actually are. It's a new way of uh, engaging with and being recognized for the kind of learning that you're doing. Great. I'm actually going to even narrow this down because for the sake of this conversation, we're really going to be talking about the skills, the individual building blocks, the micro-credentials, how those building blocks come together, and the pathways, how they come together over time, right? So let's talk about it. How does this all fit together? So number one is the skills. These are the individual little Lego pieces that we're collecting. Collaboration, uh, C++, game design, you know, all that stuff, those individual skills. How are we grouping those into micro-credentials that folks can be recognized for that connect with those learning opportunities and those learning pathways at the very top? How are we connecting the micro-credentials, right? So in the very bottom, we have the skills come together like individual Lego pieces. And then in the micro-credentials, these are sort of our little modular co collections, vehicles of uh, Lego pieces. And then the learning pathways are how they really come together over time. So this is the paradigm that things are shifting towards. And if you want definitions for these things, um, I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about, you know, reading the slides out to you. But if you want to pause it and just kind of go, OK, what does he mean when he says a skill? What I really mean is when you're online and you're looking for a job and it says skills, right? What do they mean by those skills? It says collaboration. It says this. It says uh, active listening. It says negotiations. It has all these skills. What is it? These are the basic units of the economy, right? So when you really boil it down, what are you learning? What is the employer asking for, right? Connecting that those two things together, right? That's that's what I do for a living. The nice thing about it is everyone speaks the language of skills, so. Learners are learning skills and issuers. So like colleges, universities, online programs, they're providing the skills, right? They teach you something, they validate it. They say, yeah, this person knows what they're talking about. And then the employers are the ones who actually recognize and consume those skills in the form of job descriptions, right? Okay, so that's why skills are so powerful because everyone speaks this language of skills at the supply level. So issuers, uh, learning institutions providing skills, right? Validation for learners kind of being the conduit, the vehicle for those skills, and then employers being the ones who really, really need those skills to do business or to do whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's public or private. Um, this is kind of how we communicate with one another about jobs. So let's take this one step at a time. First, let's start with an individual skill. So this is one of my favorite. It's called Project Charter. And a Project Charter is a skill that a project manager employs to get everybody on the same page at the beginning of a project. What are we trying to do? What's the charter for this project? So like guiding folks through that experience is, is a skill. It's a technical skill and project managers have it. So what happens? Uh, well, Project Charter is an important skill. It's valuable. But Individual skills aren't particularly valuable in isolation, okay? So one skill, there's no job on earth that needs somebody with one skill. It's always a list of skills, right? And they're usually related. So if I'm hiring a project manager, I might look for a project manager with project charter skills, great, but also the ability to scope out a project, which is kind of figuring out how much is it going to cost? What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? That's like an initial scoping exercise, they'll call it. Uh, and then a schedule. I need to create a schedule so I can communicate. So 
basically what I'm trying to say here is that an individual skill is valuable, but groups of skills are even more valuable. And this is generally how folks uh, coordinate, whether you're providing programs for these skills or employers who are consuming these skills. Here's just a fun visual for you to think about this. So an individual wombat, which is a marsupial from Australia, one of my favorite creatures, very adorable, uh, is a little bit like a skill. So he's out there on an, all on his lonesome. But a group of wombats is called a wonder. So a wonder of wombats, you know, it's kind of like a murder of crows or like a clouder of cats, right? Like there are these names. So when you think about a skills library, think about a wonder of wombats. So one wombat is like one skill. And a wonder of wombats is like a skills library. So a bunch of skills all in the same place that are related. Usually um, they're not just randomly associating with one another. I don't think wombats have clubs, but think about it a little bit that way. So a skills library or a skills taxonomy. So there's your new word for the day. You also might see the word competency come up though, because we always want people to be competent. We want to hire people based on their competencies. We want a more egalitarian society that, you know, your skills are what get your foot in the door, but competencies are just as important as skills. Think of skills as the name, right? Project charter. But what do you mean by project charter? What do you really mean? That's the competency. Right. So the Project Management Institute, for example, that certifies project managers, they define project charter as a learner demonstrating their ability to formally outline a project uh, in an organization by creating a document that. Right. These are the requirements. So when you say project charter, this is what PMI means. So if I hire a project manager who has been certified in project charter, I can be sure that they can do these things. Right. Makes sense. Um, it's funny because like this isn't actually how all learning experiences uh, are currently, um, you know, developed or, or implemented. There is a lot more subjectivity than most of us would be comfortable with. But there are these instances where real skills and competencies come together. And we want to really elevate those learning experiences and share them and communicate them between employers and learners and issuers uh, more rapidly and with better uh, fidelity, right? And securely and privately, all these things. But how do we do that? Well, since we're living most of our lives online these days, the average American spends at least eight hours a day on their devices. So if you subtract you know, eight hours of sleeping, that's about half the time we're awake okay, this is a big deal. So we're increasingly communicating things like skills and competencies online. How do we do that? How do we do it securely? How can we be sure? How can we trust that when someone says they can do a skill, that's true? So digital badges are the vehicle. Think about it as like the individual digital object that I'm sharing with you that lets you know what I can do and gives you the ability to verify that that's true. So this is the realm of metadata. So we're already using metadata in our in our everyday lives. When you think metadata, think, um, you know, when you upload an image or something like that online and it says, oh, yeah, you took this picture with an iPhone and you took it in October and October 24th at 4.50. Like, it's really specific. And you're like, I didn't enter that data. How does it know? It's because your device embeds that metadata into the image that you're sharing. And this is really the way that we want digital badges sort of these micro-credential containers of skills, th this makes a lot more sense at scale, right? Because especially since you're going to be, uh, you know, engaged in a lifelong learning journey, you're going to be learning things the whole time, you want things to be captured, and then we got to do this at scale, there's like going to be like 10 billion people. How do you do this? Machines and people need to work together, and that is the realm of metadata. So every time you share a digital badge or a micro-credential online, we want to also be sharing verifiable, secure information about the learner, who did it, the issuer, who said they did it, and the requirements. How do we know that it was that they did it, right? That they that they've completed it successfully. Um, and above all, that this can be shared securely, privately, uh, verifiably, so that you know there isn't a lot of tampering, which again, we have to deal with into the future and it's only accelerating. So if you want more information on metadata, feel free to refer back to the slide, maybe hit that pause button. Um, but I want you to think about like, what kind of metadata do you think you left in your wake today? Did you log into, I don't know, TikTok or something like that? 
then you've left metadata. There's a little stamp that says that you logged into this at this time. Like metadata is a way of life. And we want to take control of that technology and make sure that it's representing us accurately since it's about us. And uh, if you want some extended kind of bonus reading, you can look at GDPR over in the, the European Union or CCPA here in California about metadata and privacy and all that stuff. It's a real rabbit hole. Uh, it's one of the areas that our company focuses on. But for the sake of this conversation, we're going to focus on the micro-credentials. So where do they come in? Micro-credentials are, think of them as a container, right? And it holds all these skills. So when I enroll in a micro-credential program, I am enrolling. I'm saying, yes, I want those skills, right? That this course is going to teach me because I'm going to take this credential with me after I graduate and I'm going to show it to an employer and say, look at the skills that I learned from this program. And they say, yes, you have the skills. Here's the job, right? Or what's better, I actually want to move to a world where jobs apply to people, not the other way around. But that's for another day. So what is a micro-credential? So here's the best definition for a micro-credential. It's an innovative space. So there's currently discourse going on or uh, on right now about the scope of what a micro-credential is or isn't. And it's a global conversation. So there are governments weighing in, there's employers weighing in. It's a, it's a new technology. It's still a very innovative space. This is a very new way of thinking about how employers and you know, schools and learners, how we're all communicating with each other. Um, so I encourage you to get involved in the conversation. Take a look at some micro-credential programs, weigh in, like let people know. All right. Uh, so when we take those micro-credentials uh, that are sort of those containers and we start grouping them together, that's where pathways come in. So we've got the skills, we've got the micro-credentials, and now we have a pathway. And let's say we combine all these different skills for all these different micro-credentials. I might call this pathway project initiation, right? And think about a pathway like a year in high school, right? So like the freshman year, there are certain things you need to do to graduate to become a software and then a sophomore. And there's certain things you need to do to graduate to be a junior. And there's certain things, you see what I'm saying? So it's kind of like four kind of stacked up pathways. And if you have uh, more questions about what a learning pathway is, I included some notes here as well. But let's say you stack those individual sort of micro-credentials. Maybe they represent courses and then each pathway represents a year you're in high school. Some people take more than a year. Some people take less than a year. Imagine if you could actually display this, right? In fact, I spend a lot of time thinking about how these pathways connect with one another. So kind of like a highway system, where do you get on and where do you get off, right? And how can we create entryways and exits that better align with the learning experiences that learners need to connect them with those opportunities that I was saying before. So here's just a quick example. Let's say you started a program in project management, right? You learned how to make a plan and initiate a project. Then you moved on to executing a project plan and maybe closing it out. But then you decided, you know what? I actually want to work at Tesla. I want to work at Toyota, or I want to work at another manufacturing firm. Your journey probably won't end with closing a project in this initial pathway. You'll probably have to learn some sort of lean methodology or Six Sigma. This is actually the project management methodology that manufacturing companies use. So if you're interested in working at Tesla, something like that, uh, you'd want to learn these things. So that's your particular journey. But let's say a different person enrolled in that same program initially and halfway through uh, realize that, you know what, I want to build software. I want to work at Facebook. I want to work at, you know, Apple. I want to work uh, as my own company, maybe a software engineering firm or a startup. And you decided, uh, you know, um, software development really requires a different project management me methodology. Uh, specifically, Agile and Scrum are really what uh, software development firms use. So notice that we're personalizing the pathways to the individual journeys of our learner. And as we're creating nuance in the pathways, we're representing a greater diversity of learners and connecting them with a greater diversity of opportunities. Um, think skill tree, right? Like if you've ever played a video game with a skill tree, think about that, right? Why are video games more granular about what skills you need to progress through the game than a college even is, 
right? In a game, we know, oh, if I learn these particular skills, I can do this particular thing. I can unlock this part of the game. But the working life is a lot more ambiguous than that. Why is that? I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I hope you will too, because you're going to have to navigate these uh, uh, career pathways as you get older and you know move through your professional career. Right now, there are websites like Onet. It's kind of an interesting site. I've checked this out. Uh, they're already thinking about skills and knowledge and abilities. These are the things that recruiters, people who are hiring, are generally thinking about, but they're quickly moving into this territory where it's overwhelmingly skills-based because it's hard to measure knowledge. How do you know somebody knows how to do something? Well, you have to see them doing it, right? So this space is evolving. And these websites exist. I think you guys should check out Onet. It's really good food for thought when you're thinking about the skills-based space. Uh, and we're early days here. So let's build a pathway. So we're not going to actually do this. This is a pre-recorded event, but I want you to think about this. So going back to my professional journey, I was a scientist and I pivoted to an educator and then I became a project manager and now I'm an entrepreneur. So this is my pathway, let's call it, my individual, personal, professional pathway. Next, I want you to think about a pathway that means something to you. So just think for like a second. Okay, I'm a student now. Then I want to do this. Then I want to do this other. What do I really want to be when I grow up? That's what people ask you all the time. What do you want to be when you grow up? Think about that destination. Think about the intermediary steps. Write it down. Give it a name. This is the so and so pathway. This is the this is this is my pathway. This is the pathway. This is give it a cool name. I love giving things names. And now I want you to think about those skills. So remember, pathway, micro-credential, skills. We're going to skip the micro-credential section for now. Pathway and skills. That's all we're going to think of. So this is your pathway. This is my pathway. Here are all the skills that I needed. Well, that's not true. This is some of the skills I needed to uh, travel between these jobs. And what's interesting is you'll notice, like organization, think, okay, as a scientist, I needed to be organized. Duh. Uh, as an educator, I also needed to be organized. Hmm. As a project manager, I needed to be organized. Are we seeing a theme here? So there are some skills that are going to carry through your professional career. You're going to start out learning them and you're going to realize that they apply to other jobs. And then there's some things that maybe are going to be a little unique. So like lab safety. When I was a scientist, I needed lab safety. Actually, when I was an educator, I was a science teacher. I also needed lab safety. But when I was a project manager, I didn't really need lab safety anymore. So skills come and go is the point. Another thing I want you to notice about this slide is that some of the skills are just in black and some of them are bold and in blue. So I differentiated between what are called technical skills and soft skills. Soft skills have a lot of names power skills, professional skills, 21st century skills, blah, blah, blah. People don't like the word soft skills. I don't know why soft skills is fine with me. I like it because they're soft around the edges. They connect with the technical skills and they make, uh, they make uh, um, an employee more effective and more confident, more competent soft skills. So things like attention to detail, collaboration, organization, empathy, these are soft skills. And uh, soft skills get a bad rap, but actually... Half of employers, they prioritize candidates with superior soft skills. So 62%, actually over half, said that they have previously hired someone who demonstrated superior empathy or collaboration or leadership. And there are really good reasons why. But uh, um, one-fifth, one out of five of them said that they do this all the time. They always prioritize people with soft skills um, because it's harder to teach those soft skills than the technical skills like you know, creating a blueprint. You can teach someone who is already good at leadership how to write, how to create a blueprint. But if someone comes in and they had to make a blueprint, but you want them to be more of a team player, that's harder for an employer to do. So there's reasons why the soft skills are really valuable, but I want you to think about your skills. So think about what skills you're going to need to navigate your pathway and feel free to pause the video, obviously. So maybe three, four, five. Think about what some of those skills are going to be and bonus points if you use soft skills like collaboration, empathy, leadership, emotional intelligence, time management, teamwork, adaptability, problem solving, communication, resilience. 
these are soft skills, but there's nothing soft about them. Um, think about it, how those might come in. Maybe you're starting out as a student. It's a good place to start. What skills do you need now? And then think about what your next step is. Maybe a college student. Maybe you're going into an apprenticeship. Maybe you're going right into the workforce. Maybe you're joining the military. Think about what skills you're going to need and then go from there one step at a time. It doesn't have to be precise. Um, although I will give you a little bonus tip. If you're looking online, uh, look at the job descriptions. Like literally, what if you wanted to be a lawyer today? What do you need? Go on Indeed, see what they need. What skills, right? I bet you they're going to be listed. All right, so let's close this thing out. So obviously this is pre-recorded, so there's no time for questions, but think about those questions and communicate them uh, with the folks from Portal and maybe they'll forward them over to me and I'll do a part two and it'll only focus on questions. Um, I'm sure you guys have good questions. Here are some key topics uh, just to rein in the scope of those questions. And here's some example questions. How do I know if a micro credential is any good? Um, I actually um, did a presentation earlier for Portal, and this is a very question I got around credential currency. Why is this credential better or worse than this other one? Why is this one cost $1,000 and this one costs $10.99 a month? Like, how do I know? And you're not alone. This is a good question. And this is one of the things my company helps employers and institutions and learners navigate. This is where we come in. Okay. I'm going to give you a little recap because you got to recap. It's a lot of information. So number one, what is a micro-credential? So it's a certification. So it's a digital badge. I'm giving you something that certifies uh, some assessment of learning that could have happened many different ways. It could be online, could be in person, it could be a test, it could be a practical exam, it could be a demo. Maybe you uploaded a video of you doing it and then a professional uh, assess that video virtually. There are lots of ways micro-credentials are assessed, but it has to be assessed. It can't just be a sign my name, I showed up and here's my learning. That doesn't help anybody. They need to know if your skills uh, are connected with a specific competency. Remember that part. Okay. So a micro-credential is a certification of assessed learning that is additional. So it can be an addition to alternate. So maybe it's an alternate route. Complementary. So maybe this is an addition to something that you're doing uh, to, or a formal component of, sometimes micro-credentials are baked into bigger programs of some formal qualification. And the reason why it's a formal qualification is because um, employers are not going to want to hire someone who doesn't have a certification that was assessed or some qualification that's on the job description, right? So when it says formal qualification, that's all it means is this is an explicit requirement by this particular uh, opportunity provider. And that opens the gates to uh, recognizers, not only being employers in these sorts of things, but recognizers of credentials can also be the institutions themselves, right? So if you want to enroll in, let's say, a master's degree or a post-secondary learning experience or program, right? A PhD or a master's, right? There's prerequisite requirements for that. And micro-credentials can communicate um, uh, within institutions the same way that they can communicate uh, between employers. And they do so through that metadata that we talked about. Okay, next steps. So number one, think about your own learning pathway. So we did this together. Hopefully you pause the video, made it happen. Second is capture the skills you already have. Think about where you're at. You're at step one. You're a student, probably. Think about it. What skills do you already have? Three, imagine what skills you might need to take that next step of your journey. Four, explore all the different ways of getting new skills. So, hmm, do I need to go to college? Do I need to enroll in something online? Do I need to get some experience? Like, what do I need? It's based on those steps, right? Remember, if you're in doubt how you get to the next step, look at a job application online. You don't have to fill it out. The stakes are, are very low at this point. You want to be a lawyer? What do you need to be a lawyer? In your state also, it's regional. So like if you want to be a software developer for Apple, that's different than if you want to be a software developer for Amazon, right? So even though jobs sometimes have the same title, you might want to also go one step further. Look at the state, look at the company, that kind of thing. Okay, last thing, most important thing, and uh, other than checking, checking your typography, because I spelled this wrong, is don't forget to keep wondering. <laughs> and this is what it's like in real life. Uh, and I will update that after this, obviously. 
And I am also going to thank you um, for spending your time with me. I tried to run through this as quick as humanly possible, but because this is pre-recorded, you can always fast forward. My name is Rob Bader. I'm the founder and CEO of a little company we call Microcredential Multiverse based out of Root and Toot in Dallas, Texas. And you can get in touch with me here or you can visit my website. Uh, and I hope you do. So thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me. And I hope uh, I was able to share information about who I am, my company, my skills, who I serve, why, how you can get involved, what we're trying to do, how you can start thinking about it, and most importantly, how you can get started and on the next foot. So thank you kindly, and I'll see you next time.